Today, we will eventually be joined by artist Stephanie Dykes, and uh, we're, we're looking at the most recent exhibition in the Projective Eye Gallery at the Du Bois Center, Center City, called Signs and Gestures. Uh, this exhibition will be up until June 18th. And it actually, um, it actually has a lot of work representing several artists in this exhibition uh, because it's highlighting two collaborative print projects that Stephanie managed, organized, facilitated through the Saltgrass Printmakers in Salt Lake City, Utah. So she's a, she's a co-founder of Saltgrass and she organized these two collaborative projects um, in collaboration with the Impact International Print Conference. Um, one project called Token Gestures, which we'll look at in just a second, was actually produced in 2013 and was on display at Impact 8 International Print Conference in Scotland. The other project called Signs of the Times was a bit earlier. It was created in 2009 and it was installed and displayed at the Impact 6 International Print Conference in, um, at the uh, University of West England in the UK. And so I am going to turn my camera around here and hopefully we'll be joined by Stephanie in just a few minutes, at least in audio form, so she can answer some of your questions, which by the way, were very awesome questions. Thank you for sending those in. So this is the first series. This is the token gesture series. And I'm just going to run down the wall kind of slowly so you can see all of the pieces. Now, these are all prints. Um, and she organized this by reaching out to uh, graduate students and also university faculty from around the world, uh, basically uh, putting out an open call for anybody who wanted to create an image that would be kind of like the idea of a token gesture. And a token gesture is basically something that is said that really is quite empty. Um, and she wanted these artists to pick a subject or a theme that she thought was representative of some particular kind of token gesture or um, an empty kind of gesture that they could then make these token images of. And she oftentimes references um, the example of something like the wooden nickel or, or some sort of currency that was given to certain workers in certain industries as payment for their services, but they were tokens that they could only use to buy materials and products um, out of a store that was then hosted by that same business or company or corporation. And so really it was a token that had some value within that organization, but it really didn't have monetary value outside of its use within that business. Um, and so they created these round prints that looked just like tokens in a way. And each one of them has its own kind of theme. Let's see if I can find one here. It might be a little, a little obvious. Um, this is actually one of my favorites. Um, so it is an image of an astronaut's helmet. And it says, one-way shuttle ride, no cash value. So, you know, the implication there being, if you use it and you get a one-way shuttle ride, what's the point of having monetary value out in space, right? So we've got Stephanie on the line here to talk about the, the projects that she's organized. She's organized these collaborative print projects and then acted as, as kind of the master printer for these where she's also produced them or curated the artists and uh, produced these works as well in most cases. Stephanie, are you there? I am, hi. Uh, te uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you go about uh, curating the, the show or putting together the artists? I'm very democratic in my process. I love, you know, an idea will come up and I'll pitch it out and see who shows up. Um, there are, I will make some initial 
invitations, but I always leave space for the unknown, for the um, somebody that's emerging to have an opportunity to share with us. Um, the tokens were going into an impact print conference, which is an international show. So while I'm, I'm picking some people, I always leave it open to a call. And those that, that respond to the cause usually shine. They're a shining moment. They're unexpected. And so I go both ways and kind of mix and mingle um, those that I know and leaving a space so that we can invite others in. Oh, nice. Okay. So you've got kind of a con contingent of artists that you're thinking uh, about around the project. And then you also have a call that you, you post online and, and invite people to submit work do they in that case do you depending on like this project specifically did they have to be printmakers or were you just looking for the graphics that you would produce or okay so we're looking at the tokens right not the signs yeah the the tokens right okay. now yep okay so on the tokens there are um i can think of brian snap which is the the not circular <laughs> one that's in the group and he is a ceramic professor at the University of Utah and he really wanted to do it so um, I can think that he is probably not a full he's not a full-time printmaker but he may be the only one in there that isn't um, there tends to be printmakers especially something that size that has to be cut mm -hmm. um, you need a little bit of expertise with that and most most people won't jump in that far over their head Right. Well, and it's an oval, so it's close to a circle, right? So. Right. So, so Brian rolled out. I know this is what happened. So Brian really wanted to do it. He really wanted to do a clay circle, and I said we'd give it a try. And then for some reason he ran it one more time through his slab roller, which stretched it. And so we laughed. Um, so that has actually been inked off of um, a clay slab. Oh wow. Okay. So yeah. it was that. It was not a smooth surface so we had to go in and hand burnish together um, and we were able to pull a couple of them but it's like every nook and cranny you just had to hit with your fingertips and and so that's just like the the raw unfired clay um and that was originally circular and then uh, he brian like did like scored the surface and you guys rolled regular yeah. printmaking ink on top yes but it was it was bisque. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll pretend I know what that means. Um, so it had, it had been fired once. It had not been glazed, um, which we really had to kind of saturate the ink to allow it to kind of release and capture the surfaces. But, oh, very cool. Okay. So running it through the slab roller didn't crack the bisque firing. It just stretched it out, though. That, yeah, in the clay, in the leather stage, you know, when it's still soft, that's when it's stretched. Oh, I see. We okay. So we, so we could burnish off the surface. Ah, uh, okay. Interesting. That's that's really cool. We have a lot of stu uh, a couple of students in the in the senior thesis class that are interested in the crossover between ceramics and and print. So this is this is really great. Um, and then yeah, there's artists so, like Ed Bateman in the show that I know who are more digital media, right? Right. So Ed Bateman's a longtime friend, teaches um, photography at the University of Utah. He, um, that's laser cut early on, right? That was when we were first getting our hands on the laser cutter. So he's, he's proficient in the laser cutter and the 3D printing and all that kind of stuff. And he does this hybrid between photography and, oh. you know, three-dimensional output. Um, and so he, and I think you'll also see Lewis is, is also a CNC of our laser cut. Those were brand new tools way back when. Right. And I saw this show in, like you were saying, you did the, organize this as part of one of the early uh, impact conferences are, are fairly early and you've those are are print conferences that are international they they're organized by or, or were kind of begun by Steve Hoskins right at the uh, University of is it uh, West England, West England. 
and and um, you've been you've participated in those shows from the from like early on, right? The 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 impact shows. I I do. I mean, print conferences has changed. Print conferences has changed my life. I'm I'm a much better person, and I see more of the world, and I have friends everywhere and and have been exposed to lots of different um, ways of seeing and perception and production as far as print is concerned and you know i'm born and raised in utah get me out (laughs) (laughs) um and and traveling you know we first started doing the national conference with southern graphics and then i very quickly moved to impact it's an it's it it's part of my budget. It's part of my essential budget to be able to travel and be engaged with other artists. That's been huge for me. And so this, the tokens was in uh, Dundee, Scotland, and, and I got to see uh-huh. it there. And you had like uh-huh. the, the part that is this, this version, the, the to scale prints that were, were made directly from the plates. And then you also produce like a, a little like ink tin of coasters as well. I did. I did. So for each artist, what happens is, is really we weren't going to edition, you know, um, prints that are 24 inch diameter. So I said to everyone, I said, if you do this, then I'll make a little coaster size three inch diameters. Um, and so you can have a set. So all the artists got a set of the smaller tokens. Um, and because that still stays within that object and that form, you know, to go from a larger circle down to a token that, that, you know, you can hold in your hand. But then I took it one step forward and I put an open call to the print conference people and said, if you sent me a digital JPEG file, I would make a special Dundee set. So right before that conference, I was doing like three, four hundred, you know, tokens before I left town. So. There was the official one that echoed the big prints, and then there was a special edition of tokens just for those that participated in Dundee. How do you, uh, how, do you, uh, like, I, I just, that's what I love about printmaking is the, uh, not just the ability to reproduce, but to kind of reformat things to make one idea accessible in many different forms. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, I that's, that was great to be able to have that takeaway from the show and and to have this extra layer of of possible participation i thought that was genius yeah yeah i you know there's always feels like there needs to be a takeaway whenever i'm doing something big like an exchange like this and so i really do try to do something you can hand to other people to walk away with and yes i think the total freedom in printmaking is, is that we can translate it in whatever output we want. And and did you have, so you printed the coaster sets as well, or did you have those commercially like made at a local business or? No, no, we were, no, I printed all of those. Wow. <laughs> I locked up my shoulder, yeah. <laughs> But then you got to, you know, you got, you got, had this great show uh, in Dundee, Scotland and all all of this great response from that. So um, maybe we'll switch up to the signs now, which was actually an earlier collaborative uh, piece that you did for, uh, or for an earlier uh, impact conference. And this one was in, from Estonia, right? It went into Bristol. Oh, it Bristol. Went into okay. University of West England. Yeah. Um, that was so. That was my last year in graduate school, and and it's really difficult for students to get to the international conferences just because of the expense and things like that. So um, I thought I'd send out an invitation for graduate students or PhD students, whoever were involved in their studies and do a global network of graduate students. And so I put the call out. I had to like funnel it through um, universities and institutions to find out who was working. And then those people just came back in. And I'll tell you most of these, I mean, I can't say most of them. All of them were unknown to me. Um, And some of them are still good friends and some of them I've lost contact with. But the idea was that we could globally come together um, with this, 
edition, the signs of the times, and then produce it and be at the conference. Some were able to get to the conference, but it was a big thing for a graduate student to be able to reach out to other graduate students and make this the first one in. Yeah, and so so then I I'm sorry I thought it was like one of the uh, you know like second or third impact conferences, but this was wasn't this one of the first then or was this the first one? No, this was the, this conference was the one that came back to to um, Bristol the second time. It was not the first one. I haven't been to that many. I haven't been to South Africa. Haven't been to South or Africa. The first one. But you, yeah. yeah. So, but then these signs were actually exhibited outside as part of the conference, like on signs. And, and did well, you yeah, install that? Yes, I did. There, yes. So, so all the signs were, um, every, all the digital images came in. They had to be fit to a template. They could check, um, they could choose which template to be, whether it was a caution or a stop or uh, one of the other shapes that I've got their circles. Um, they could choose the template that went with their image and then they would send it to me. We reproduced them onto the vinyl that at that time had to be adhered to the aluminum backing. Now we can just print directly onto Centra. Right. How cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would have made my life so much easier, let me tell you. So I adhered the vinyl to the aluminum to the shapes that had to be pre cut and then shipped everything out to Bristol. And when I got to Bristol, everything got mounted onto um, tall wooden stakes and I pounded them into the ground. Mostly successful. I had to come back the next morning and pick up the ones that had fallen over. But yeah, I mean, they're good to be outside the whole time. That's great to have. You drive, up, oh. you, know, you drive up to the conference and you go through the roundabout and there were the signs all the way around. So the first show you saw was this one. Oh, that's great. And the yeah, the roundabout would be a perfect location. Wait, did you already have that? Like when you propose a project like this, that's, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, the print, a print conference, at, at least it has this kind of traditional air to it, right? That it's going to be works on paper, you know, in, in a gallery. Did you did you have when you applied with this idea to the conference? Did you did you specify that you wanted it in a roundabout, or how did you how did you go about that? I was, you know, when they invite you to a, a, a the conference to to exhibit, you have to be able to respond to whatever space they give you, and with that one. I knew there was outside because my professor at the time was Justin Diggle and he was familiar with the campus. He said there is a there was also another kind of wooded walkway up to the conference, but then there's the driveway walkway. So I knew I could pitch them an outside exhibition, but I'd be ready to do it anywhere. You know, I, they easily could have been inside too, but they're they're more fun or funner if you're from Utah um, <laughs> when they're outside. <laughs> Right, right. Oh, yeah, I bet. So, and that adaptability is is part of what you, what you're, how you build the project, right? Like you, you know, you're going to need it to be adaptable to, um, you know, the possibility that you know the space isn't going to be available when your plane lands, or you're going to have some other thing to deal with. There's, yeah, you'll be running to the hardware store looking for something. <laughs> because whatever you brought isn't working, you know, um, and you really do have to be adaptable. It's handy if you can carry them on the plane with you, but these two projects were too big and had to be shipped in. So there's your, there's your anxiety. Will it make it? Will it make it through customs? Right. Well, and I mean, it, you know, the, the idea too that, you know, you talk about travel and that is an experience then adding this extra experience of trying to find, you know, the, the hardware store in, in, at, you know, near the University of Bristol or, you know, uh, you know, or in Dundee perhaps, but, but yeah. this, yeah. this idea that you're, you know, you're, you're kind of uh, embedded, right? All of a sudden it, it, through this experience of organizing an exhibit. It always works out. I don't know how, but there's also lots of 
people there that could step in and go, you need to do this and this. So there was always, I think it was as able to, to manage everything on my own. But, you know, Bristol had a step stool and a hammer so I could hammer the post and chew the ground and things like that. Um, Dundee I had to run around to find the adhesive I needed for those um, tokens. But there's always, you've got to be, you got to be a little... Uh, flexible and ready to do whatever you need. So install day is always pretty stressful, but after that, you're good. Nice. And then, yeah, then you can really enjoy yourself. And um, yeah. you've talked about some of the, the, you know, connections that you've made through, through these collaborative projects. Um, can you, can you uh, give us an anecdote about a particular, you know, not necessarily from these two projects, but because you've done several, but has there been a particularly memorable collaboration that has come out of, out of this, uh, these projects? Man, put me on the spot. Oh, sorry. Um, I see how you are. I, you know, I can't, I can't say that there's one shining moment, but I do know that, that once you put the work out there, then somebody sees it and picks it up. So like tokens went down to print Austin during their, their big print week. Um, and the, the signs kept moving around. So somebody will see it somewhere and then it moves to somewhere else. So the work takes on a life of its own. And I think that's what I, I value in the collaboration and inner, inner, um, you know, the, the conferences that happen, that the work just takes on its own life. Right, and, and, and these is, have essentially toured now, you know, across to, to different, different locations like Print Austin, uh, yeah. down in Texas. Awesome, that's great. Yeah. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk to you about too is, and, um, you know, we we were hoping to get some shots in the studio, but you know, technology isn't always there for us. But you you also right. run a, a print studio, a community based print studio in Salt Lake City that I I love and it's one of my favorites. But um, could you tell us a little bit about Saltgrass Printmakers that that you're a co-founder and and operator of? Yeah, so you can you can um, go to the Instagram for Saltgrass Printmakers or the Facebook for Saltgrass Printmakers or the website, and you'll be able to see what I'm talking about if you're interested. Um, Saltgrass is a nonprofit print studio in Salt Lake City. We organized it in 2003 with my two business partners, Eric and Sandy Burns, on um, for a nonprofit. We have a board of directors, and we are an open access printmaking studio for. Those that, that um, can work independently and know how to use the equipment safely. I also do open hours Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays when we're not in pandemic mode, where people can drop in and do a daily rate work on their projects. So the members have 24-7 access. They can come and go. They have lockers. They have flat files. We have all the equipment for etching, relief, screen printing, digital applications in between, a little bit of letterpress, which is what I'm doing now. We're doing a National Poetry Month, at least getting ready for it, and printing poems that I put out a call and said to my community, said, if you write a poem and you come in, then I'll help you set it on that show card press. And they've been making um, note cards and posters and everything all week, all month long. We've been doing that. So, so Falkreath is been around since 2003, that's 17 years. We did have to move and we went dark for about six months. But, you know, it's a dream come true for me because when people say, you know what I want to do, I'm like, yes, come on in and do it. Come, you know, come into the shop. I have the equipment, I have the space, I have availability. And I've never been, had to say no to anybody. It's just a matter of working out when and how. Right. And I, I mean, I, I love it too. Part of what I, I've enjoyed about going as, as a visiting artist is that you, you get the visiting artist to do workshops with the community. So that's part of the way the, 
the studio itself, uh, you know, generates, you know, some funding, but it also gets the artists interacting with and meeting people in the community directly. Right. Because we're a nonprofit, we have to do uh, a fair amount of education, which we're happy to do because we're kind of, we're geared that way. So, so when I'm, you know, we do basic classes and I offer basic classes at the shop. We do it in partnership with Lifelong Learning, which is a community education program. We also do our own classes. Um, you're welcome to join those regardless of your skill level. But then the other part of my education philosophy is that we also engage those that are here printing with something new or challenging. So I always like to bring in people that are doing things that we aren't doing here in the Valley and having that class, having that um, intensive workshop so that they too are kind of honing their skills or growing. Um, and every time we do it, everybody gets super excited. The, the visiting artist comes in and says, this is what I want to do. And I equip the shop with just what they need to do, what they, they want to do. And then we do the intensive workshop and then my members are doing it. And then other people see what's going on. So it really feeds the shop physically, like equipment. Um, but it also feeds us in you know, creatively and um, knowledge base too. So it's a win-win for us. I'm I'm scrolling through the the website and and uh, to show show the uh, people online as well and we saw the the upcoming National Poetry Month um, uh -huh. and and then uh -huh. you you also did kind of well uh, mid I, I'm hoping it's mid pandemic but in on uh, in September you did a, a steamroller event and and you developed kind of a um, a, a, a format, right? The mandala, the mandala format as, as a way for community members to create and, and then you print it outside on the steamroller. Can you talk about that uh -huh. a little bit? Love that project. I love it, I love it. In fact, it's in North Carolina. Um, just, is it, what is, where is Kannapolis? Oh, Kannapolis, that's right, right. So this is the project that's at the, the private collection in Kannapolis, is that right? And the mandalas will be outside in the wooded area so anyone can go through and I can give you all those details. Um, yeah, that's very close for April. us. Okay, yeah, it'll be up in April. Um, it looks like the 15th through the 30th, but here's how the mandala came about. It's pandemic mode. We're shut down. The shop is locked down. I'm not doing any public entry. I'm trying to keep the shop safe for the members that are full time, you know, that's our family cluster we're trying to maintain. So, um, but I thought the one thing you can do is carve at home. So, so while we're isolated and while we're home alone, it's the best time to be carving some kind of relief, right? So, um, then my idea was if we tried some with the steamroller, you know, the idea is it's scale is unlimited, so you can go as big as you want. But with this one, I wanted a way that that could be interconnected, that people could bring what they had carved, recombine it, and, and go forward, kind of like an exquisite course. So we um, had a local company, CNC, um, shape. So I have a centerpiece that's round, an inner circle, and outer circle, and they all nest together. So um, people could come in and pick up a, a shape, take it home, do whatever subject matter they wanted, whatever, however they wanted to carve that with power tools or with their hand tools. And then I told them that when it was safe, we would come back together and we would print outside in front of the shop with a big paper, a big smooth drum paper. So, so you know, the pandemic's going, it's getting scary, and then it settles down. And I think, I think we can do this. Like, so September, I contacted everybody and said, okay, I think we can do it September safely. We're still going to wear masks. I'm going to schedule you about every two hours so that not everybody was in the shop at the same time. And they all showed up and they started to ink their blocks and then people would come in like, oh, I want to mix mine with yours. And so what you'll find with those mandalas is that the imagery shifts and comes and goes and their subject matter comes and goes, but every one of them works. So when we come together, 
we have this strong uh, three-tiered mandala figure that I then dyed very bright colors. So they're printed on Tyvek so they can be outside. And my idea was, you know, so we individually carve them, we come together as a community to print them and then send them back out into a larger community. So they've been at schools, you know, up on the chain link fences and now they're in North Carolina. So that's great. That's what they've done. Yeah, it's been good. And, you know, here we are again in the summer and it's like, oh, do we steamroller again? Because it's a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, that uh, that was my first time doing it was out there, and yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's much more work than a press for sure. Yeah, well, we've got to fine tune here. You know me. Oh yeah, I'm I'm sure I'm sure. <laughs> um, so if it's okay with you, I um, Adam, if it sounds good to you, oh, I thought you were right behind me. Um. Uh, we, we could do some questions that we we can receive questions. Um, we can uh, we've also got a few questions that were sent in earlier by the students. Um, and yeah, are you ready for that stuff? Sure. Okay. Um, Just raise your hand. <laughs> haha. Uh, <laughs> so there's a, a few questions about the the studio, the saltgrass. Uh, studio, and um, one of the one of the questions Nikki Thrower asks is, uh, could you uh, how did how did you get it started, and what motivated you to to set up a community print shop? So, um, two thousand probably two thousand two. I'm a senior working on my BFA. I'm a non traditional student. I'd gone back and finished up my BFA, and it's my uh, last semester, and I know I'm a printmaker, and what am I going to do, and where am I going to go? Every time I pick up a tool or use a material, I'd ask my professor, like, where do you buy this? Why do you buy it? this brand? And things like that. So I was making this running list. In the meantime, my partner, Sandy Brungon, was working on her master's up um, the painting and drawings on the third floor and the printmaking's on the second floor. So she was a fun me working on her masters, but she also dipped into some printmaking. And so we were kind of um, going back and forth, but we really didn't know each other. Sandy had gone to the Austin Print Conference and just was amazed with the small presses in Austin. And what happens is with a strong print program, these small presses just kind of naturally pop up around it. So she was like, why don't we have one of those in Salt Lake? And nobody had the right answer. And then Justin said to Sandy, well, maybe you should talk to me. So Sandy and Eric and I got together and started thinking about what a community press would be. There was no community open press in Salt Lake City. There was no open access. Um, there were a couple of private presses, but they're, you know, they're few and far between, right? So right. we started we started looking for spaces, and she was working on her on her her project paper and her thesis, and I was running around looking at studios, um, and we decided we could pull an investment and start a place. So we started in this little baby bungalow house that had been cleared out for a business previously, and we started there. And we bought everything from Surplus, and Eric Brungon, who is my other co-founder, he decided we could build the press, and we did. So we have a really nice, we have a large press for etching and relief that we built from plans off the internet, and he's a professor at the University of Utah that, um, in computer engineering, but then his friends up there, if you knew the CNC, so we have people that thought it was so so sexy to help build a press that they would volunteer their time and everything. So we built our initial press, which is probably 36 by 48 on the bed. And we did that for like $2,400, you know. That got us started, surplus and, and building our, our press. And then over the years, we just slowly brought in one thing every year. 
And, and to to now where you you know I was trying to show some pictures of that initial uh, house business that uh, <laughs> that you guys were in and uh, it was you know I remember you know cleaning the screens out in the in the bathroom in the bathtub yeah but I I mean you you were able to set it up in such a way that it it worked so well and that press that you you know, there there are plans for presses online or, or plans you can buy and uh -huh. um, uh -huh. that directs you to different tool and die people to make them. But that press is still in the studio, right? It's still working and- uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we use it. We use it. We probably use it weekly. We have we have two other, we have a tap cash, we have two other tap cash presses in different sizes. But that, that press that we built that, that I call Bart. Bart is a great press. It, it is. And it, yeah, it, it, it hasn't hurt anybody, even though the bed sometimes flies out of the other end. But yeah, I, I love, I love Bart. That's, that's, that's not my fault. <laughs> it just means it's working. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right. That's right. Um, someone that you may know, Anya has a question. She asked, could you speak about what initially attracted you to printmaking? How did you discover the medium? That, that question is something everyone goes, oh, what drew you to, to printmaking? I can't tell you. I can't tell you why I thought that was my route, but I signed up when I went back to school. I said, yeah, I'm a printmaker. And I started taking printmaking classes. And yes, I am a printmaker. I love that I am trained across the board in screen printing, etching, relief, and that when I have a conceptual idea, I have a visual language that matches it. So that means if I need something really drawn and um, really kind of an intuitive approach, I can go with an etching. But if I need a lot of color really fast, multiples then i'm going to go with screen and so i i love the freedom between those visual language um and i love that that printmakers have this open dialogue with each other they'll come up with an idea or a theme pitch it out to everybody and then everybody comes back in with their own perspective now we're having a conversation in the dialogue so i like that working language and how open and receptive we are to all those voices. Um, I like the lost in translation. You know, I can't, I can control a lot in printmaking, but some things just happen through the process. And I like that lost in sound a lot. Oh, I like how you describe that, the lost in sound. Um, uh -huh. the, uh, there's a, another uh, question. Um, and uh, it might be a bit personal, I hope it's okay, but uh, I know that you are also a mother of, of two. Um, and there's a, a question from one of our senior thesis students. Um, can you speak a bit about motherhood in the life of an artist? Um, uh, or, or the, you know, you've, you've worked with ideas of motherhood in, in your artwork as well. Could you, could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so, so how, how it is to be a mother and be an artist. I went back and finished my undergrad when my youngest was in first grade. So all of a sudden I had a block of time. I would drop her off at, at first grade, run up the hill to the university, and then have to be back at her door by the time the bell rang because she was a bit of a, an anxious child. Um, but it worked, and I made it work, and I went part-time, and that meant probably going longer than it needed to. But I also knew that the family had to function and be happy, or I wasn't going to be able to do what I wanted. Then, and that was just going slow. I'm just trying to keep all the balls in the air, right? And not overload it too much, even though that's a lot to take on. Um, then I graduated in 2003 and the kids were getting older. So we took five years, got Sawgrass up and running and went back to be, um, to do my graduate studies. By then my kids could drive. 
So I didn't have to actually physically be somewhere. They could contact me. I knew their schedule. They could feed themselves. They could bathe themselves. It was a good thing at that point. <laughs> um, but when they were smaller, you know, I was carving blocks on the kitchen counter because I could stop and start that. If they needed something, if they drifted and could do something, I could go right back to that carving. And so I kept it to processes that weren't tied to a dark room or weren't tied to an etching tank that I could do at home. And that's where I started. Um, and then the, the relief blocks just got bigger and bigger. So then I did have to kind of move out. But, you know, it's always this, I don't want to say it's a balance because it's never balanced, but, but maybe there's a harmony you can strike between when you need to pay attention to your relationships regardless of what they are and when you need to be in the shop or when you need to be um, on your own just thinking lost in the woods so it's always kind of this shift in priority because everything's important um, and just to listen and to hear that and not panic that you're not going to get something done if it doesn't happen today. I think sometimes we think we don't get on it, get on it now, it's never going to happen. When in truth, things evolve the way they're going to evolve. Right. Did that help? I mean, yes. You know, so I, I did, I paced myself, and there's, I have no illusions that you can do everything, but I think there's, there's a real sense of, of flow. Be really be really fluid in, in how you approach your relationships and, and your artwork and your commitments. They're all important. Right. And and that I mean in all honesty, yes, I, I mean that's what I, I've I, I think you do a, a great job of and, and personally working with you over the years. I, I that's been a great inspiration from you for me, you know, is, is to let, you know, that that kind of ability to let things flow and you know, that's how you can take on multiple tasks as an artist, but it also uh, gives you the opportunity to enjoy all these different things too, right? Rather than just making it all a kind of stressful amount of responsibility. Um, right, right. Yeah. And you know, because, because uh, I don't want to say artists are privileged, but it sure feels like it. It sure feels like we uh, have this creative kind of luxuriousness built into our lives and to be able to move through that is is just it, yeah it's like a blessing but it's really pretty pretty amazing that we get to do this kind of stuff and yes we have responsibilities and yes we have to do those things too so we have to step up to that um i tend to you know, I'm always thinking of something new to do. You know me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> someone, someone always asks me, it's like, oh, well, don't you worry that, you know, you're going to you're gonna find a spot where you, you can't think of anything to do? And I'm like, wow, what would that be like? <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be your nirvana moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> be like, whoa. <laughs> you know, because one thing leads to the next thing. And if you're out, you know, um, doing your self-care and, and exploring and, and being curious about things, then the next thing will present itself. But if you're not, if you're not staying curious, then you're right. I think it can dry up. Right. Yep. Well, thank, thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm sorry about the, the technical issues starting out. Um, and, and uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's not your fault. That is totally on me. Um, uh, but, you know, thanks from everyone here at, uh, in Charlotte that are, are listening in. Thank you all for signing on. And Stephanie, it's great to hear your voice and, and we'll, we'll see you again soon. Any, any final thoughts or anything? Um, um, the door is always open at Southwest Printmaker. So if any of you are venturing out into the West and need a trip to the jetty, you contact me, stop by, you know, and, and visit the shop, and I'll take you out to Spiral Jetty. So the invitation's standing, never expires. And and that's uh, that's a that's an honest uh, honest invitation, I can tell you all. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the doors open. I tell everybody that the doors open. Come on in. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Thanks for your generosity and. 
I'll be in touch. I'll be here.